Hello, students. Uh, this is presentation number eight. Uh, in this particular presentation, we're going to talk about three main things. Understanding municipal solid waste franchises and open markets. We're going to talk about how do you prepare winning uh, RFPs and proposals. And uh, finally, uh, talk about grant writing. As a setback when um, uh, Deep Throat was talking to um, uh, one of the uh, Watergate investigators uh, for the uh, Washington Post, uh, they talked about follow the money, follow the money. <clears throat> well, there's probably no better thing to do to really understand the industry of solid waste than to follow the money. In the waste sector, there's already plenty of money in the system, about 60 to 65 billion. So what we need to do is not spend more, but spend differently. And since we won't be changing everything overnight due to the immense sunk costs in the existing system, we have time to transform the business of discard management to take advantage of the new paradigm. In essence, we don't have a waste problem. We have a resource opportunity. Uh, a good friend of mine, Eric Lombardi of EcoCycle, uh, uh, talked about that, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, we already have plenty of money that's in the system, and there's even money, even more money than the 60 to 65 billion that you find in trash management. There's like 60, there's like 110, 120 billion that's involved in recycling. Yet even that is small potatoes compared to uh, the entire GNP of the United States, which is in excess of $20 trillion, and even the state of California, uh, around $2 trillion. So when we talk about waste and stuff, uh, again, is there's a lot of money in it and people have spent a lot of time, um, you know, sort of like, you know, dissecting and evaluating and trying to come up with new ways of doing stuff. But really, we just need to transform our business model and, and take a look at things. And, and, and that's just what we're going to do in this presentation. Waste collection is the largest segment and constitutes $37 billion, or about 61% of industry revenues. Transferring and processing waste and recyclables represents $10 billion. Waste destruction, that's like landfilling and incineration, are another $13 billion and $2.7 billion, uh, respectively. And two companies, Waste Management and Republic Services, account for 39% of total industry revenue. Now, there's the other side of it is that municipalities do undertake a lot of collection. And I, at last time I recall, there were about $17 billion of the entire, entire industry. Okay, but the major players are Waste Management Republic, and, uh, and uh, we'll take a look at some of the other revenues of, of, of similar haulers. Yes, indeed. Some people might say there's gold in them, there are hills. Yeah, the hills being a, a landfill, especially one that's completed. Uh, this is a listing of the top 50 haulers. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of them that are missing. Athens, I don't see here, Athens Services, and I know they're, they're quite large here in Southern California. Uh, you know, but this is, let's say it's like 95, 97% of all the haulers in the country. Uh, so uh, sometimes some of the companies don't like to disclose how much money they're, they're actually making. But I'm sure that it's in the hundreds of a million dollars for um, a company like uh, Athens Services. Uh, but they range from like number one rank is waste management. Waste management has been up there for quite a few years uh, at about uh, 15, um, uh, looks like billion dollars, $15 billion. They're headquartered in Houston, Texas. Uh, Republic Services headquartered out of Phoenix, Arizona, about $10 uh, billion. And then it goes on from there. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, number 38, where disposal uh, out of Santa Ana. They're about $45 million. Uh, so they're not a huge company, but they're not a tiny company either. Um, 
I actually have had a hand in, in raising them from about six, six million in 2000 to where they are today. Uh, maybe you've always wondered about like what really, where is the money in, in trash and trash collection? Um, and there's quite a bit, you know, like I mentioned, you know, it's collection is a bigger segment of the industry than 60% um, of the total industry uh, revenues. And landfilling is like only 11, 11 billion. So 60%, you know, 37 billion versus, uh, you know, 11 billion for, for landfills. Uh, and some of those haulers own landfills as, as well. So that represents some additional revenues to them. Uh, but in terms of the economics of hauling, and I'll use these little toy trucks here to illustrate this, there's, you know, four basic segments. There's residential, single family, typically picked up with side loaders. There's commercial front loader, pickup bins, sometimes permanent bins versus uh, temporary bins. And then there's commercial roll-off trucks. Uh, the residential single family, uh, it's at least profitable. You gotta go door to door. You're picking up a small amount, relatively speaking, once per week and typically the same price, no matter how much is placed out there. And it takes like about 500 to 1,000 homes to fill up a truck. And sometimes these trucks do double or triple duty. Like the same truck will go out and first pick up, let's say recyclables or green waste or trash and and then green waste or one of the others uh, on the second pass and go empty and come back and pick up the uh, remainder. Uh, often that's how that's done. Um, typically it's anywhere from $12 uh, a month per household to about $60 per month per household. Uh, you know, but like I say, it's it's, pretty standard. You're guaranteed a certain amount of, of revenue based on the number of, of uh, homes, single family homes. But remember that, you know, in terms of industry, uh, you know, private and, and public uh, sector collection, that uh, single family homes on average are only 25% of the entire waste stream. So, you know, you got to take a look at that aspect of it. So the big part is the commercial. Okay, and that's going to be 75%. Some of it, 15% uh, overall is multifamily. The rest is is business. Um, you know, but of that um, of that uh, commercial, you know, picked up with front loaders, it's got good profitability since it's almost pay as you throw. Um, the frequency and container size dictate pricing. You want a one three run one a one three one is one bin three yards capacity, one time a week. So what's a two, three, two? That's two bins, three yards capacity, twice a week, okay, and on and on. So if you got uh, six, six, six service, <laughs> you got the worst service or the, the maximum amount of service that anybody would ever want because that's six bins picked up uh, in six cubic yard containers, six times a week. Um, anyhow, the, uh, you still have to fill up with about 40 bins worth of goods at a 131. And um, it's about $100 a month to upwards of $1,000 per month, uh, depending upon the location. Like in San Francisco, $1,000 a month is not unheard of. In LA, $100 was, was kind of the average until the uh, zero waste system came in. And now it's like uh, double that. Um, temporary bins. Temporary service is is a little bit different, even though you use kind of the same bins. Um, it's most profitable because it's a seven day rental, <coughs> but it's the same price as one month. So if you're paying a hundred dollars a month for a bin picked up four times a week, and and you want a temporary, you're let's say you don't have a regular business, you just need something picked up for a week, uh, you're going to pay the same amount but only seven days of rental. And so you pick up one time, that's it. You want you want to be picked up again, you're gonna pay another another rental fee, you know, on that. So it's a very, it's actually the most profitable part of the business, but it's small market obviously because it's temporary. 
uh, commercial roll-off truck. That's the little truck there with the big bin on the back. Very profitable since it's a single bin. And on average, maybe about $600 per pool plus you pay for your tonnage. So the more service, the larger the containers, the, the, the greater the temporary sense of it and so forth, you know, more and more cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Now this, this particular um, uh, slide gives you an idea of how generally the flow of solid waste is, the, the waste stream activities you got. In collection, you can either have mixed waste collection, which you go to a MRF. Uh, you can have recyclable collection. You can have yard waste collection. And each of those can go to a, more than likely go to a trans, some transfer station or MRF. And, uh, and then you have transport activity, which may be before uh, the MRF and compost facility. Um, again, this is kind of an idealized thing, so it's not, it's not as accurate as how I would do it. But um, generally, you'll find the transport part after MRFs and compost facilities and waste to energy and landfill would be, you might say, the ultimate destination. And, um, and so they generally are the solid waste facilities, the disposal, what they call disposal facilities. Uh, MRFs and compost facilities are waste stations. And um, they, they're, they're much more than a transfer station, obviously, because a MRF will break stuff up and transfer stations generally don't, as you well know now. And then compost facilities actually take material and break it down into new product. So they're almost like a recycling facility itself. Uh, sales activity, you got sale of energy from waste to energy and, and obviously from landfill. What's the energy from a landfill? Methane gas. And then you got MRFs that sell recyclables and uh, compost uh, facility sells compost. The solid waste industry has its own version of full cost, cost accounting. Obviously, it doesn't account for all the costs of individual products that are found, you know, the commodities, used commodities, the wasted commodities, discards that end up in the trash. But insofar as the uh, costs of, of municipal waste management, there are what you might call the, these, these aspects of full cost accounting. There's certain upfront costs, you know, like to educate people, outreach, buying land, getting permits, building construction, modifications, there are contingent costs, you know, like what about uh, you find out about a release of, of or spillage, you know, so remediation, there's liability costs, sometimes property damage, personal injury, trucks have accidents too, and there's natural resource damage as well. There are operating costs. Some of the normal costs are like operation and maintenance, capital costs, the debt service, things of that nature. Uh, and then there can be some unexpected costs, you know, like where if you don't own a landfill and all of a sudden the state says the landfill is going to cost X amount, you know, that's an unexpected. Um, there are back end costs, you know, like when you want to close a landfill, you got to close it properly. You got to get permits for that. And then you got to take care of it afterwards. That's called post closure care. You have building and equipment decommissioning, retirement and health benefits for your employees. And then you can have remediation costs at the inactive sites. And, and that can be very expensive. Now you got to investigate, got to drill, you got to contain, you got to clean up. Oh my gosh, that can really be, that can really be tough. The environmental costs of environmental degradation can approach millions and millions of dollars. And in fact, some cities in the, the uh, San Gabriel Valley, for instance, had, had allowed their waste uh, through permits to go to a place called Operating Industries Landfill. It ended up being a super fund. And of course, EPA came back and said, well, who's been dumping here? They took a look at some of the material. They, they saw stuff that came in from cities. They went after some of the haulers, but they also went after the cities because the cities had permitted them. And the cities ended up paying millions of dollars in, in, uh, in, in degradation costs. 
you know, so that's that's an important consideration. Then, of course, there's the social cost, community image. Nobody wants to dump in their backyard, but we know that a lot of um, communities, especially communities of color, um, really are disproportionately targeted for these types of facilities because they have the least power to fight them. Uh, you don't see any landfills in Beverly Hills, but you've seen uh, landfills in Compton, for example. Well, let's calculate the refuse rate. And the rule of thumb is that collection equals 70%, disposal equals 30%. What do you do with it? And, uh, and together, that's 100%. So if you're involved in waste management, that's generally how these uh, costs tend to, to bear out. And we saw that you know, in our, in our initial slide with the, the amount of money out of the 60, $65 billion, how much of it is, is collection. Um, this includes all costs of collection, storage, processing, transfer, and ultimate disposal. And uh, of course, if you're developing a rate, whether you're on the uh, receiving end, like uh, you're a city looking to uh, hire a, a hauler to be your uh, franchisee, um, you want to know what what your citizenry is going to be, uh, your ratepayers are going to be charged. And if you're a hauler, you're going to develop costs uh, that are realistic and uh, reflect um, all the true costs that you're going to have to face. Uh, and what are those true costs? Those are things like capitalizing your bins and your MRF, uh, your rolling stock, you know, that's your trucks and things. Uh, your daily operations, you got to pay people to drive your trucks. And and I'll tell you, truck drivers are expensive. They, they all make $100,000 or more a year. You got the disposal cost. You know, you're going to have to you're going to have to find a disposition for your material. And um, if you don't own it, you're going to pay, you know, the maximum rate. Um, unless you can work out a special deal. Uh, there are government fees that you have to take care of. Sometimes those can be uh, can range up to 40% of your total cost. Uh, GNA, that's your general administrative, and typically it's like around 10, 12%. And then your profit margin, um, profit margins can vary. You know, if you got a lot of temporary service, your profit margins a lot. If you're residential, you might be restricted to 10%. You know, it kind of depends. And, and usually to develop your SFR costs, single family residential costs, you divide your total gross cost of all of these different things by the number of accounts. And then you divide by 12 for 12 months during the year. And it gives you your monthly rate. And that can vary. Again, like seniors, for example, usually get a break, you know, and, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, apartments get a break, you know, just because there's a lot more people and you handle more people per stop. You know, so sometimes that's a little bit better for a hauler. You don't have to drive the distance between small amounts of material. But there's many factors that influence rate. Um, and, and, and rates can be influenced, for example, by how exclusive your contract is. If you're one of many, well, you're competing and you could drive your price down and consequently, you know, rates could be less. Uh, if you don't have to be competitive. You're competitive at the very beginning when you're, you know, putting in your bid. But after that, it's like you're on easy street because you're going to charge that regardless. And next time around at, at the annual cost of living increase, you're going to get cost of living increase. So it's going to keep going up and up. And if you got a 30 year contract, oh my God, you're, you're really doing well. There can be fees can influence rates, fees by local governments. And fees are, are quite variable, anywhere from 2% to, you know, to, like I say, 40%. Um, how much available infrastructure, if you got your own transfer station, MRF and landfill, you're going to charge yourself a heck of a lot less than you're going to charge your competitor. <laughs> and, um, and what kind of sector you're servicing. If you're servicing only the residential, well, you're kind of limited to how much money you can make. And if you're servicing temporary, you're making a lot of money. Uh, how far do you have to travel to tip your load? If you only have to go a mile, you, you're 
basically it's it's like so much dollars per mile and if you're a long distance away it can start ending up being quite expensive to move material which is why we have transfer stations in the first place because our landfills are not close by typically anymore uh, labor and unionization uh, some uh, some of the haulers are not unionized and they'll pay lower rates to their to their workers hourly rates than a unionized uh, you know crew would would pay and then fuel you know that obviously has something to do with the two and if you're paying if you're like in a um, uh, a heavily regulated uh, area like Los Angeles where you got to be pay strict attention to air quality requirements and you must have uh, natural gas you know you can end up with um, having higher fuel costs and repair costs and maintenance costs than you would if you're just driving a typical diesel uh, diesel truck and just getting regular diesel uh, fuel. So let's, let's examine a couple of communities for their uh, zero waste uh, uh, information. We'll take a look at Diamond Bar and we'll take a look at uh, Recicla. Risa Claw was a real game changer for a lot of folks in LA because a lot of businesses had stuff really good. There, there were a lot of folks that didn't even have uh, accounts. They just put it in their neighbor's trash can, um, you know, or at, at a business in any respect. And uh, some people just dumped stuff and blamed it on the uh, homeless. Um, and a lot of this came out once they went to the zero waste system and picked seven haulers to service 11 areas or 11 zones. Um, but this is a, uh, a rate scenario that was provided by the city of LA. And uh, to try to explain how folks could, you know, get lesser cost out of the system, you know, and it's all dependent upon recycling, of course. And, and what the, the city does here is that they put recycling in as a freebie. It's not a freebie, but it's put in like it's a freebie. In other words, that the costs, the true costs of the rates, which went from, let's say, $100 to over $200. In fact, the base rate is $216.72, or like that's what it was when the program started a couple of years ago. And, and so that includes your trash and a recycling bin, okay? You're automatically given an equivalent size and service bin, and that's for a 131. So if you have that, a 131, and then all of a sudden, and you were paying $100 one week, and now someone has your service, they're a new zone person, and they're sending you a bill for 216, I would get a little upset too, right? Now, if you have two, <laughs> three cubic yard black bins that are serviced twice per week. What's your monthly service rate? Well, it's the base rate uh, for two times a week, which is $406 and 42 cents plus 250.93 uh, for an additional black bin uh, two times a week. And all of this is in a matrix that you can look at, you know, so as a, as an owner, you can see this complicated matrixy and, and figure out like, I'm here, so this is what I'm gonna pay. And if I wanna add a bin, same frequency, same size, this is what I'm gonna pay. Okay, so that's how these numbers come up. But all of a sudden, my gosh, now I'm paying for two bins, uh, service twice a week, I'm paying 657, whereas probably, my gosh, a week before I was paying $200, you know, per month. Now I'm paying $657. That's three times as much, right? Okay, so now I'm really upset. So I call up and say, rah, 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 rah. I want my rates the way they used to be. Okay, well, excuse me, but we can potentially reduce your service rate if 50% of your waste is recyclable. Convert, if we might suggest, one of your black bins to a blue bin service for a cost of $406 because if you take 50% recyclable and 50% trash, you only need one bin. So that's, that's uh, let's say two bins uh, once a week. So, so each bin is, uh, is picked up at, at once, once, once per week at $406. 
you can forego that extra $250 for that additional bin, black bin two times a week because now it's converted to recycling. Or you could retain the two black bins, add two blue bins, and reduce service frequency for all bins to once per week. And your new rate is $418.99. Based on all this little uh, uh, working out all the numbers and, and picking out stuff out of the out of the matrixy. So the idea there is like you can pay 657, or one way is you can pay 406, or another way is that you can pay 418. But to, to pay the 406 and 418, you're going to have to do some recycling. If you don't want to do recycling, you're going to pay this money. Okay, we're sorry, but you're going to have to do that. With the city of LA, the city of LA went from a, a sort of free market, open market to controlled market and a closed market franchise. Uh, here is a case study in free market going to a closed market. Actually, it, it resulted in a lower cost, you know, initially, of course, because over time, once you get in a franchisee, then you get cost of living increases and no longer is it a regular competitive. I can call up whoever I want and have someone come up and pick out my trash. You know, you can't do that anymore. You got to go with the established hauler. Um, the established hauler, you know, why, why do this? You know, um, well, instead of having, let's say, seven trucks or more come down the street during the week, you know, you're going to have only one truck coming down the street. Um, and um, it site the streets look cleaner, things of that nature, you know, so there's a lot of benefits to that. Uh, but here in Diamond Bar, initially we went from $15 per household per month in 1999 because that's what I was able to uh, discern from calls to uh, all the haul different haulers that were picking up. It was average about $15 per month. And once we set up the new program, it went down to $12. Per household per month, and and that was actually with P P A Y T. So with P A Y T, the smallest container. So before it was fifteen dollars a month, you could throw out whatever you want. Now it's twelve dollars a month, but you have to restrict yourself to how much you're throwing out. So even though it went down, we made people restrict what they're throwing out, give them more of an incentive to waste less. So if you wanted to throw out unlimited like you used to, it probably cost uh, maybe about 25% more. I think closer to $20 a month it would have been if you wanted to compare apple to apple, okay? Uh, but since we're trying to get people to reduce, it's better to look at, hey, here's a way to save your money. Stop wasting so much, okay? And, and then on top of it, if you did more like you did backyard composting, you get a reduction, about $3 a month, $36 a year. So my gosh, if you're paying 12, you, you're minus three, you're paying $9 a month. I mean, my gosh, you know, uh, organics are 60% of the waste stream. And and even if you're just doing grass clippings and, and food, you're, you're probably getting close to like 30, 35% of your waste. So you're going to see some reduction in cost. And over 4,000 households took advantage of the discount, which required attendance at a compost workshop. And they had to use a supplied composter, you know, container, and they had to return their, their green bin. And then they could not put any green waste into their, into their trash container, unless it was like palm fronds or, or big pieces of wood or something that were not supposed to go into the, into the green bin anyhow. The city also got lots of additional free services to the community. They got a new 10% franchise fee, an AB 939 fee, and no cost technical support to communities and residences, and recyclers were allowed to operate. So I think all in all, it was a pretty good deal. Okay, let's fast forward to the present. What's happened over time? Uh, pay as you throw residential and Diamond Bar still is there. Um, but you can see the costs have, have gone up and and these are not out of the ordinary and I'll show you a, a chart um, a later um, in which we identify, you know, typical rates. So if you want to keep these rates in mind, 
you know, $22 for the small container. Seniors pay 18 uh, for the largest size, 32, you know, which is like almost triple. And, you, and you're not paying triple. You just, you're paying, you know, like another, you know, 30% more, I guess. Yeah, 22 plus 10. So you're paying about 30% more. But if you want extra carts, they're going to cost you more. And you can see there's a stepped increase, 22 to 27, 27 to 32, from the 35 to the 64 to the 96. I found that if you don't, if you go less than $3, people are just going to go to the larger size. But if you make it $4, definitely $5, then people will really actively try to get to the smaller size. And I thought it was interesting to see what the dollar per unit is. You know, if you are got the small size container at $22 a month, you're paying about 14 cents per gallon. The largest size, you're getting a break, you're, you're paying seven cents a gallon, almost half what, what the person who has a 35 gallon container is paying. So yeah, the same trucks gotta come by and they gotta pass by your house and they're gonna have the same fuel cost but your disposal cost is not going to be as much and you're not getting to throw out as much. So in a way, you know, it's sort of, to me, it's kind of like giving something to the wasters out there. Okay. But if you're going to have more waste, you're going to definitely pay more. And the recycling rate, that's, that's the real nice thing is that if you recycle more, you don't pay more unless you want additional beyond two carts for uh, green and for gray, which is the recycling. A lot of times commercial rates are also structured to mostly benefit wasters, but uh, do provide that the more you generate, the more you pay. It's just, just because you got more service and more bins, you're gonna pay more. Um, and in Diamond Bar, it's very similar, but we tried to moderate some of that impact. And uh, you pay by the bin, the number of times emptied per week. And um, six times per week in this example pays more than five times per week. That's just uh, one for instance. And then, you know, as you go down the tier, you're going to pay, you're going to pay uh, less. But if you look at the cubic yard cost, the cost per cubic yard, you can see that the smaller the container and the less the frequency, you're going to pay more per cubic yard. Um, but it's um, when you get down to six times a week, it's only like a, you know, a, um, a, a decrease from 10 to about seven. So it's not that dramatic. It's not like a double or a triple like it used to be. It used to be like $2 per cubic yard. And for the small containers, it was, it was like, um, oh my gosh, uh, I don't know, maybe about $13, $15 per cubic yard. So it was like a huge discount, you know, and then subsequent pickups, there's, there's additions. Here you can see that the recycling bin is a break over the trash bin and a little more than 50%, I approximately a little more than 50% of the standard bin rate. Now, again, that's to encourage more people to use a recycling bin. Now, if a business is really savvy about stuff, they can uh, they can do some of this stuff themselves, or they can hire a consultant, or they can ask the city to give them some free technical assistance, which is what happens with the uh, Recycla. All the haulers had to give free technical assistance to all of the uh, uh, generators, all the accounts. And here in the city of Covina, that's not the city of LA, of course, but in the city of Covina, this is like, my gosh, 1990, I want to say 93, sometime around there, I started commercial recycling programs back at that time. Nobody was doing this, just nobody. I was like the first in, in the business, you know, as a consultant to do this type of stuff. And it was just amazing. Like at Michael's, an arts and crafts store, maybe you've, you've patronize that that particular location. You got a lot of, a lot of neat things in there. But uh, I went to one Michaels, they wanted technical assistance. And I went out, did an audit, and I found that 
all the stuff was going into a compactor and they were paying about $600 a month. And the total cost per year was about $7,200. And they said, well, we want to we want to find out if we can save some money. And that $7,200 included a 10% franchise fee. So the city was making $720 a year just from their service alone. And hey, it's not a lot, but you know, when you compare all the things in the city, I mean, you're talking about millions of dollars. So the budget for the city was nicely augmented by these types of figures, okay? Now, I went out, did the audit, and I found that, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, 90% of what they threw away was eminently recyclable. It was like wood and and fiber and, and easy to recycle plastic and, and such and, you know, products and things like that. So I said, look, uh, let's set up a recycling system for you. And oh my gosh, the complaining from the from the employees, so we're gonna have to sort everything. I said, no, I want you to sort out your contaminants, the 10%. Oh, we don't have to sort all the other stuff, just the contaminants? Yeah, I said, keep the food out of it. And we'll put that into something else. Keep certain things that are not very recyclable out of the recycling container. We'll keep that compactor for recyclables only. And then we'll add a small three yard bin for refuse. And just doing that, and the hauler agreed. You know, this is one of those cases where the hauler actually did a good job. And uh, they said, sure, we'll, we'll do that. We'll go through it. And, and, and if there's enough value there, We'll cut a check for Michaels. And and lo and behold, that's what happened. It yielded $125 monthly revenue to Michaels, even after including the three yard bin cost. So Michaels was ecstatic. <laughs> it was something that was costing them $7,200 per year. And all of a sudden they got a net return per year of $8,700. That's a complete flip. That's like, at 7,200 and 8,700, that's a $15,000 flip in 1992, 1993. So they were very, very happy about that. And uh, the side effect, of course, was that the city fees were reduced to 10% of whatever the 131 bin was. So even though Michaels wasn't paying anything per se to the hauler, they were getting a check each month they still were paying because all those costs were deducted. So if Michaels really wanted to do a good job and make more money, they could install their own baler and they could have just paid the hauler for the small bin and then they would have paid whatever the, the city fees would have been. The hauler would have collected it and paid it to the city, but Michaels would have made even more money. So the hauler, basically was keeping probably about 80% of the revenue, okay? Because there's a cost to the to the compactor, a cost to the small container, a cost to the processing. And all that the Michaels people had to do was make sure that the food stuff and unrecyclable stuff didn't go in the recycling container. So I guess it was a win-win for everybody. Bonds, one of my favorite uh, uh, programs because they've done such a great job with uh, uh, with their programs for sustainability and and um, uh, for sustainable materials management. Uh, previously, Bonds landfilled all their organic waste. Uh, the in the past, uh, container and collection and landfill costs was probably around $150 a ton that it cost them. Um, now all organics are diverted by composting and or animal feed supplements, things of that nature. Uh, but uh, they divert now and they do that uh, principally not by using the um, hauler, but by reverse distribution. In other words, they backhaul. And we talked about that before. But reverse distribution method is used instead to collect their organic waste so there's no additional travel cost to them. The truck comes out with the new goods and as it empties, it fills up with the old good. And then it takes it to a location where it's then 
made sure that it's clean, uh, packaged into a into a truck that intended to carry all the organics, and that goes out to the uh, composting site, a remote composting site, where everything is processed, and and there the costs are about $150 a ton. And that total processing includes the cleaning the organics, hauling to the compost site, composting in the soil amendment, uh, providing bags and bagging, and transporting the bag soil amendment to the Vons distribution center, where it then gets loaded back on the truck, and so it goes back to the stores, and, and it sells out. All of the bags sell out, sell out every time they have them out there. Well, the avoided cost of disposal is 150 since you're not, you know, you're not taking it to the landfill anymore. And the cost of, of transportation to the composting is, is basically uh, uh, free. Um, and, um, and so what you have then is the processing cost of, of composting. And so those two things kind of cancel out. So what is it that you really make from this particular program? Because there's a cost to everything, right? Extraction cost. And I've talked about that before. It costs money to extract recyclables, uh, just like it costs money to take things to the landfill. Uh, but that sales revenue is actually kind of exciting because, you know, when you compost, you don't have 100 percent. It's not compost. Food waste and organic waste does not translate 100 percent into 100 percent. No, it turns into gas and water and solids. So 60% of the product remains after composting. And so if you take one ton times 0.60, you end up with about 1,200 pounds of product uh, per original ton. And if you sell or bag into 20 pound bags, therefore 1,200 pounds divided by 20 pound bags equals about 60 bags of finished product. And if you sell those at $5 a bag, then 60 bags times $5 equals $300 per processed ton. So if you sell those, you're making $300 on that. So what's the net revenue? $300 per ton net revenue is all their bags are sold out. That's quite a profit center, wouldn't you say? Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully, we can find in the future where distributed organics recycling programs can see these types of profit centers develop for local community or organizations. So anyhow, we talked about the uh, sort of the economics of it. Uh, um, people compete for these contracts and franchises and things, not all not all cities franchise and contract, but these days it seems like a majority of them do. Um, but there, there's still a few that are open market or they just have a few permittees uh, that, that do stuff. Uh, but this section, we're going to talk about contracts and franchising. So we're talking about franchise and open market. Uh, a lot of folks may think that franchising in the municipal sector is, uh, you know, something that uh, uh, is, is a real negative. No, I would say so, because even business practices, franchising all over the place, franchising is a way of life in many industries. Um, uh, for example, uh, McDonald's, uh, they, they don't sell the business, they sell franchises. And when I sell, when I say sell, they basically franchise out, and if and you can buy one of their franchises, but the business still belongs really to uh, McDonald's, uh, in in that they control the brand and and such, and how you do things is in accordance to their rules and requirements. And if you don't cook McDonald hamburgers the way they say, you could lose your franchise. Okay. That's that's a that's a fact of right, so fact of life. So um, so that's that's part of it. Now they do own the land, and and that makes McDonald's one of the top two uh, landowners in the world. Guess who the other one is? The Catholic Church. But in any event, uh, franchises you know confer a right to waste, like for companies like Waste Management. 
uh, contracts tend to dictate an activity. You know, you can have, it's not really a right, it's not a conference of right, but really more a dictation of some specific activity that's specified under contract. And then permits really just give permission for people to operate. That's, that's all they do. They don't specify anything other than that you can operate as long as you operate legally. And the kind of arrangements that you can have, um, you know, for, for things are exclusive. That kind of implies a singular entity, like a sole exclusive contract or franchise for uh, commercial and for residential. And a lot of communities are turning towards that. Um, there can be semi-exclusive. Two or more entities have a conferred right or a contract. And then you can have non-exclusive. So a non-exclusive permit environment really is very, very close to open market and as close as you can get. And uh, basically, as long as people have a business license, you know, they're, they're free to operate and they can go around and there's no, there's no uh, specification on what you can charge, things of that nature. Now, sometimes people can put permit conditions in which you must supply recycling, you must show your, um, uh, you know, whatever you pick up for recycling, whatever you pick up for trash, and you gotta, you gotta re report that. And you might even have to pay some type of uh, fee to the city, like a gross receipts fee as part of your uh, permission to uh, pick up trash. There are franchises and open markets and people are going to argue about each of them, which is better, which is worse. Um, if you might, in my mind, I like open markets, which give freedom of choice, but it's tempered with the need to follow the requirements of the local community as to the level of recycling and and uh, what happens with the material. Sometimes you, uh, a city can specify, you can pick up, but you gotta take it here to a location where they can MRF it or they can process it and get the maximum recycling. And if you want permission, you know, a permit, then you gotta pay into the kitty, so to speak, and make sure that you're uh, paying your fair share of, of community burden because trash trucks are heavy and they wear out roads a lot faster and they cause a lot of potholes and things and they cause traffic and and sometimes they emit a lot of emissions unless they're natural gas and most trucks are not natural gas you know so there's a lot of issues there but generally you can say franchise markets have the rates for services provided by haulers and other waste service providers set by local legislation ordinances uh, any location within a municipality limits must utilize the hauling company designated by that municipality. And more importantly, the rates for services are also set by that municipality. Franchise markets have higher overall costs than open markets, generally due to the lack of competition and ability to negotiate, and the fact that typically a lot of municipalities embed additional fees into the franchise agreements to recoup their administrative costs. But that's not always the case. You know, you don't have to have a franchise to get a permit fee, to get business license fees, to get, um, you know, um, you might say gross receipts fee. Those things can be built into an open market condition. So it's, it's not necessary. Open markets allow <clears throat> more people to do business and companies, the generators may procure agreements from the hauler of their choosing, and they can negotiate rates, which are in line with their budgets and expectations. But uh, again, a city can say, everybody must recycle. So you're gonna have to buy recycling services from your hauler, whoever the hauler may be. And since the rates are open for negotiation, typically you see lower costs associated with open markets due to competition within that market. Now, just for your information, most of the USA is open market. Uh, areas like California are not open market. 
and um, there's well I shouldn't say they're not open market but the majority of the of the communities are closed uh, communities they have franchises now because the state said it, they could do that AB 939 specifies that you can use franchise arrangements to help you meet AB 939 and that's what cities did and that's what haulers did now guess who argued for that the major haulers argued for that to be put into the law so that was very interesting Los Angeles franchised this commercial waste into 11 zones that uh, saw rate increases of anywhere from 100 to 300 percent and if you want to know more about about uh, tools about transforming uh, contracts and franchise agreements you can go to this this uh, website for uh, EPA we see really did make waste history in, in a couple of different ways the commercial always was open in LA City and there were like a hundred or more haulers in the city and now it's franchised uh, in, among seven haulers in 11 districts. So that really, you know, a lot of put a lot of biz, haulers out of business. Uh, the companies that have um, these zones are Athens, Waste Management, Republic, uh, Universal, Ware, NASA, and CalMet. Rates increased, but options did also. Uh, just for your knowledge uh, I wrote the proposal for where disposal in which they got a uh, zone there were 15 companies that participated in this and they gave seven uh, um, zone uh, franchises Recycla making waste history yeah it sure did well, it covers refuse recycling and organics, including food waste and green waste, and includes about 130,000 accounts, businesses, institutions, and apartments. It does exclude certain recycling activities where people are collecting things in pain and uh, for their materials. You know, like whether uh, um, you know, a full circle recycling is one company that goes out and and uh, places bins for recycling. They don't charge anybody for it. Um, there's also companies that go out and do charge for things like uh, electronics uh, retrieval, um, sharps, uh, paper, confidential paper destruction, things of the nature, and, and also C&D debris collection. And as long as these activities meet city permitting requirements, they are allowed to occur. Now, the number one first step for any system in LA is that you have to perform waste audits. And the zone haulers are all required to provide annual waste audits for free to every single account. Well, refuse contracts are indeed big dollars. Refuse contracts are among the largest contracts that are let uh, given by local governments. Franchise fees are a big inducement. Some don't charge much, but some charge as much as 40%. So if you got million dollar contract and you got 40% franchise fee, you know, you're adding on $400,000 to the local community. So you get your $400,000, you know, off a million dollar contract, you know, and that's important for the city, but it's, it's something that the local community has to bear. Uh, there's also AB 939 fees and other types of fees. Uh, generally, uh, they're applied to uh, single family residents and often are, are quoted as a, around $1.50 per household as a minimum per month. And then uh, there are also host city fees for, for the MRFs. And also a lot of contracts provide a host of community services uh, support. Um, in some of the contract work I've done, uh, it's it's enabled uh, especially when I went after haulers for for um, fraud and things of that nature they ended up having to pay a lot of money which went in to support uh, recreation and senior services and all kinds of, of programs that they uh, ordinarily would have would have been able had to had to lose but definitely a lot of services are supported by by the waste hauling contracts
I used to do a lot more of this type of work with cities. I, I, it's, it's not exciting to me. And other than just making money and stuff like that, that's always exciting, right? Well, here the city of San Dimas uh, contracted with me uh, to conduct a survey of residential and commercial rates. And they wanted me to take a look at uh, surveying 22 different cities, which I did. And um, they were looking for what are the fees or rates, uh, franchise fees, solid waste facility tipping fees, fees imposed on recycling, uh, pricing structures and their impacts, uh, you know, and and um, um, actually I didn't get the RFP until the day it was due and they held it open for me and I turned it in the next day and I got the job. So that was that was really nice. One of the stipulations in the contract was that I had to do it like really quick. You know, and I did 21 days for the survey. We prepared a survey instrument, uh, conducted the survey amongst uh, two dozen uh, nearby cities, uh, assembled and reduced the data, standardized and evaluated the data, and provided findings in a short executive report. And like I had mentioned before, you know, there's there's like there's the gross rate, there's the base rate, and then there's total city fees. And I want you to see how fees can range and how that affects the, the rate. And, and then even then, how MRF processing can affect rates as well versus source separation. If you notice on the right-hand column, additional comments, the, the least expensive cities, because this is on oriented by uh, pretty much um, uh, uh, gross rate and uh, standard service rate, I think it's standard service rate. The basic standard service base rate is the rate by which we organize stuff on this, you know, from lowest to highest. So the stand, the gross rate is not on the basis of low to high and neither is city fees. But when you deduct city fees from the service gross rate, you get the service base rate. OK, and that's for the typical home not seniors, not a whole lot of other things, just your basic rate. And so that's what we're comparing. And, and when you take a look at that, you can see that the standard service base rate goes from about $16.51 all the way up to about $32. And you can see on the, on the right-hand column that the least expensive uh, uh, services are all pretty much all source separation, three bin containerized service. And the more expensive ones tend to be more of the um, uh, MRF processing, uh, put it all in the one bin because people are paying that extra premium to have somebody go through their trash. Now, some of the MRFs that are up here that are lower in cost were done several years in the past. So as a consequence, the costs then were lower. And, um, and so they haven't risen up to the level of some of the other cities. Uh, I thought, interestingly enough, too, some, some cities, if you look at the city fees, go anywhere from uh, very low. Uh, let's see here, um, uh, Rosemead, $1.83, $1.08 for Arcadia, $1.40 for Laverne, uh, 80 cents for Upland, you know. And then you look at some others, all the way up to $10 for Glendora. A 25% uh, uh, fee uh, placed on on rate. You can see it takes from $30.66 standard base rate up to $40 gross rate. So you know the residents are paying much more, and they do more processing. The uh, some just just for your um, information. Uh, there's 89 total jurisdictions in LA County. And this table shows you the various area franchises. Um, the mostly small cities are pretty much exclusive. You know, mostly small cities, uh, 30,000 people or less, 10,000 or less homes. And uh, they tend to be mostly uh, 
um, um, I would say residential type cities. And there's, and I'll describe this in a second, there's four different types of cities. Okay, but I'll, I'll describe that in a moment. Um, but there's 59 mostly small cities, mostly small cities that have exclusive commercial collection systems. And then you have a mix of small and large cities that are non-exclusive, and there's only 10 of those. You know, and then you have some very large cities, Long Beach, Glendale, Burbank, Pasadena, Torrance. There's like about 13 of them that are permitted. They have permits only. And Los Angeles was one of those too, but now they moved into their own category, zone franchises. Nobody else in California has zone franchises. And only one other uh, city in the country is even looking at that at this point, and that's New York City. They haven't decided on that yet. Uh, but these cities, Long Beach, Glendale, Glendale, et cetera, et cetera, are permitted but closed. And then you have municipal services in which the city actually conducts the service. And there's basically four cities that do this, Santa Monica, Culver City, Claremont, and Whittier. They pick up their own material. Culver City and, and Claremont pick up everything. I think Santa Monica allows some, some commercial haulers. And I think Whittier provides uh, for commercial hauling to, to be, no, 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 not according to this, I'm sorry, maybe back up. Municipal commercial collection is done in these four cities. So excuse me, I'm, I misspoke, okay? And then Rolling Hills has no commercial. It's all, it's all uh, uh, basically 200 or so homes. And, and then you have the County of LA, which is 140,000 unincorporated areas. And it's mostly permits. Uh, but they are moving to uh, uh, residential uh, franchises, but not yet commercial franchises. But they may get to that point as well. Uh, so the county represents a commercial collection system, but it's spread out over a huge, huge area. So obviously this begs a question is how do people go about getting these RFPs and, 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 or get these proposals? How do they end up with this, these lucrative uh, contracts and stuff? Um, we're going to go over that now. Well, you have what you call requests for proposals. So cities, and counties can issue a RFP, which is a request for proposal. They could ask for a request for qualifications, RFQ, or they can directly ask for an, a bid, a request for bids. So that's why RFP, RFQ, RFB. Those are three different distinct types. And you can, uh, or cities can conduct this process totally in-house uh, or they can use a consultant or a combination of in-house and consultant. Uh, so they have that as an option as well. Uh, and as some of the examples that I'm well aware of, and, and, and actually I did a lot of these RFP processes for uh, communities, I, I don't tend to do them anymore. Um, it's a lot of busy work. And even though it's lucrative money, it's, it's I, there's other things I want to do uh, with my time and effort. Uh, but Monterey Park had a consultant and the city take a look, and they ended up offering a single uh, company, uh, the, the residential franchise, and then they offered two companies a competitive franchise for the commercial. And, um, and then Norwalk was, was another uh, company that ended up offering uh, a, a, a residential uh, segment for, for contract and, and then a uh, commercial uh, a franchise for, for a single hauler as well. And the city of LA, of course, split up into 11 zones of which they awarded seven distinct contracts or, or franchises. Sometimes these things can be quite difficult to go through. Um, Norwalk started their process, oh, six months before an election. 
and they didn't they got through just a month before the election which meant that the city council didn't want to make a decision because they didn't know who or what was going to be the new council makeup so they decided to you know like sandbag the process and leave it to the next council to make a decision and of course that council decided to throw everything out and the consultant and start over again and then they decided that they didn't like what was developed and they fired the city manager and did the process again until sort of like you can keep doing the process until you get the outcome you want well that's expensive for the haulers that are trying to submit, you know, and it's expensive and very difficult for, you know, communities to go through a process like that. As you can imagine, I mean, for the haulers having to um, do these proposals, it can be a whole lot of preparation, a whole lot of writing. And uh, I'm not exaggerating too much by that stack of paper, you know, because uh, a good foot, foot and a half was was the L.A., you know, proposal that was done for uh, a variety of different companies. And they ended up spending millions of dollars to have those things reviewed from the 15 uh, companies. Um, and companies paid a lot of money. They pay anywhere up to $100,000 for these proposals to be written, $100,000, and only half of them got, got awarded. So the other half were out a hundred grand. You know, it was pretty amazing. Uh, but typically what the process includes is like there's an announcement that goes out and, and it kind of depends on, on like, is the city, um, are they already in a franchise? Is, is their franchise coming up to, to a point where they're ready to go out to bid again? That they don't want to, you know, just uh, continue with the existing hauler. Or maybe they just want to go test the waters and, and uh, see if they can get a better deal. Okay. And then some communities is they've never had a, a franchisee before or a contract. And some people just ordinarily like to like to do this on a, on a regular basis. So you got an announcement that comes out that says on such and such date, uh, RFPs will be issued or Qs or Bs. And as a consequence, you know, people are invited to participate. And usually that specifies that certain documents are gonna be available. There's a schedule that has to be adhered to. There may be a pre-proposal meeting that they want you to attend. And then if you have questions or, or you know, if you have any questions about the process, you got to ask them by a certain date and they can provide you answers. No questions, no answers. Uh, and then there's a proposal due date. The uh, city will receive the proposals on that due date and uh, then they will proceed to open and review. They might have a process in which they do a, you might say a preliminary review and um, and then maybe a full technical and and uh, and cost review um, but sometimes they do that all together uh, they generally come up with a short list and an invitation to interview like if they get 10 different proposals they might invite three to five of them to show up the city of la asked all 15 to show up and give presentations and i tell you that was that was interesting and um, but mostly it's like you know if it's clearly one you go with the one if if there's like you want to hear two or three you know you ask for three to come in and and uh, so you create that short list you select from that short list and begin a negotiation and if you can't come to terms on the negotiation like ah, i'm sorry but we can't uh, the city is not interested in lowering your bid. You know, they're not interested in giving up that right. They're not uh, wanting at all for, you know, for the hauler to uh, not provide certain types of services. You know, I know that all of the haulers were, were complaining about some aspect of it, like having to do free audits, but um, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. And, 
And so if we can't come to terms, you go on to the number two bidder. And if they can't come to terms, then you go on to the number three bidder. And if you can't come to terms, then you, you open up the process again. Um, but let's say that the first person gets it and they like it, they, they like the contract, everything is fine, it's peachy keen, and, and so you get an award and approval by the council or supervisors. And any, any place, it's, it, it can take anywhere from two years to three weeks in advance of a desired start date. I, I've seen RFPs come out 21 days ahead of time, and it's just crazy. You know, and and it's like, well, wait a second. You know, we got to transition and stuff. <laughs> it's just kind of crazy. But usually, uh, a a year to two years is 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 the best. Um, even three months is difficult. Six months is difficult. And you ask why? Well, you got to order stuff. You got to order trucks. You got to order thousands of bins. Tens of thousands of containers, you know, if, if you're going to replace everything, if they want all new stuff, you know, and that takes time for manufacturers to meet the order. So we try to give enough time in the process for everybody to uh, uh, be able to fulfill the terms. When you when you see some of these RFPs, RFQs, RFBs, and and you know it, it can be quite daunting. It, it, they look like a lot of work, and yes, indeed they are. Now, if it's if it's just a qualification they want, that's a little bit easier. They're not asking you to tell them what you can do or how you're going to go about doing it. Uh, they're not even asking for money, how much money you're going to charge. They just want to see your qualifications. Then, based on that, some cities kind of like, you know, take like a few from a lot, take a few and say, we want you to supply either a bid or your proposal. And so they don't have to go through so much work. You know, it's easier to look at a qualification statement than it is to look through qualifications and bid and also technical response. So sometimes cities go through that process just to eliminate the amount of work. Um, but sometimes they ask for everything. And, uh, and, and I'm very familiar with, with that, and most cities do just that. And then, of course, the bid is like, just give us your rate, and we'll select from that. Uh, but very few you know, cities do that. Mostly that's businesses do that. They just want to know what the bottom line is. Uh, but with, with cities, you know, you got a lot of other considerations, like how are you going to treat my community? You know, what kind of freebies are you going to give us? You know, how are you going to help us with, with our community responsibilities? And you don't have the same questions with the business. Okay. But in any event, the, these, this is typically what you see in a RFP table of contents. You know, there'll, there'll be an introduction and background, you know, things about their their city and about the contracts term and specifications and what they expect what's the process you're going to go through what's the schedule uh what's their current services you know because you got to know what you're bidding on and then they may put uh proposed service requirements they want you to uh, tell us what are you going to do with uh, uh you know cost wise for residential commercial multifamily, industrial What's recycling going to be? Refuse, organic, city services, any special services you're going to uh, provide. A lot of those things are going to be identified as to these are things that we want and need. And then they usually identify how they want your proposal to to lay out. You know, they'll have things like uh, general requirements. Uh, give us your rates in specific forms. Do you have any exceptions to a contract that we included? Uh, what are your qualifications of your firm, your key staff? What are your financials? Uh, transition and implementation. How are you going to, you know, if we go to you and we currently have somebody, how are you going to work with them to make it a smooth and seamless transition? Uh, what kind of services, your minimum recycling requirements you're going to meet? 
you know, so there's a whole lot that goes into it. And there may be even additional things that they put in there. And they also may show you the sample contract and ask you to comment on it. If you're part of the team responding to an RFP, it is a lot like this guy here. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, and sometimes you end up feeling buried by the whole process because it's sometimes it's, it's quite a bit of work. Um, LA, they really, really made it a difficult, you know, process because you had every conceivable consultant and everybody had to show why they deserved their a quarter, half, and full million dollars. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And of course, the city uh, staff had 15 different council people to, uh, to deal with, and they knew it would be a huge problem because they were going for the first time to a commercial uh, franchise system. So they wanted double check, triple check, quadruple check. <laughs> they wanted everything laid out there so there was not going to be any way that that anybody could come back and pull the rug out underneath that process underneath that process but if you're responding to an rfp first of all you got to understand the process so if they talk about stuff you got really got to read and understand what it is that that's being asked for you got to adhere to requirements don't make stuff up don't don't try to I'll, they don't know what they're talking about. They really mean this. No, no, no. Just stick to the facts. You know, they say there's a mandatory meeting. It may not be legal, but you stick to their mandatory meeting or else they'll make it really hard. You don't want to end up suing them because you'll never get any work with them ever. You know, so attend the mandatory meetings. Make sure you, you do that. So that means you got to do the research. You got to read the darn proposals, the RFP, and, and read every page. You got to read every page. And I'm talking about 289 pages, 300 and some pages, 500 pages, whatever it takes. You got to read it, do the research. And then you got to make your response complete. Don't leave out anything. You're going to have a checklist and make sure everything that's on the checklist has got a corresponding thing. If they ask for X number of copies, you make sure they get X number of copies. If they want something on a jump drive, USB, you make sure it's in the jump drive or USB. Now, you got to meet exactly what they say. If they say on the box, if you're going to put it in a box, it's got to be sealed and they want, they want the bid in a separate package in the same box, you got to make sure your bid is in a separate bag, mark confidential and, and sealed, but in the same box and on top of it, whatever they specify for how they want it addressed, you better make sure it's exactly that. That's a complete response. And make sure you answer every single question. Um, a lot of times these are competitive. So you're going to have to really figure out, you know, like, what's my what's my rate? One of the, um, you know, the uh, proposals that I did not win, uh, it was lost by my client because of 0.02% difference in price. The county liked their proposal, but they gave it to the, to the competitor because their price was 0.02% more. You know, so it's like, oh my gosh. And they were the existing they were existing hauler. I won them that contract originally, and then they lost it because of 0.02% increase. You know, just ridiculous. So sometimes people can try to buy these things. And the other company was their reputable firm, you know, and, and, and funny thing is it was in an area that has a lot of horse properties. That contractor came back to the company that I work with and said, would you do the horse stuff? You know, it's just too much manure for us. We, we don't like it. And so they gave a subcontract back to the company that lost the contract, you know, to them. So it's kind of funny. And then you want to have a good team to help develop the, the proposal response. You know, make sure you got your, you know, legal people, your, your budgetary pe financial people, your technical people, you know, and, and, and others to kind of overlook everything too. You want an extra set of eyes. And you want the big boss to uh, take a look at this as well. So you want to have a really good team to help develop things and, 
and share things and switch them around and and comment and stuff on them. And sometimes you can work a long time like I have, so they feel very comfortable. My client feels very comfortable. And uh, I'm always, you know, like taking a look at what I write and trying to do better all the time. So they do appreciate that. We just don't, you know, cookie cut and put a new cover on it, you know, because that, that's always fraught with uh, risk. You know, you never know when you're writing for the city of Alhambra and all of a sudden the city of Lawndale pops up somewhere in the document. You know, pretty embarrassing. And that that leads right into good writing and presentation skills. You got to make this thing look good. Hey, if they're asking you to write reams of paper, you better be interesting in what you write because someone's got to read it. And, and if it's boring, you know, oh my gosh, people are going to fall asleep. And, and if it's not exciting and it doesn't look good and it, it's not eye-catching, you know, you're probably going to get downgraded. Just just the nature of, of how things are. Everybody likes a good book. Everybody likes a good story. So your proposal's got to be a good story. So take the time to write a good RFP and or a good proposal, you know, for the RFP. Uh, include visuals and, and such. The only thing that you cannot, you know, bargain with or, or you know, make any assumptions about is the politics. Like I mentioned, Norwalk, how many iterations they went through to pick a hauler. Sometimes, you know, people come in and they uh, make backroom deals and uh, it's not right. You know, it's it's obviously a, that, uh, you know, someone should win and, and yet the council gives a contract to, to the incumbent, you know, because they gave them a lot of money and they don't want to say goodbye to a lot of money, you know. It's just kind of kind of awful sometimes how these things do end up. I'll give you an example for a typical RFP for MSW services. In other words, like the proposal and the city of Alhambra, this was due, uh, oh my gosh, um, in September. I think it was September the 10th, and request for a proposal for residential and commercial services. The RFP, key elements, were, it was like 289 pages plus two addendums. The um, uh, consultant specified that the information must be organized according to the outline and attachment one, Requested information should be identified by letter or number in the outline. So we had to follow their exact specification there. Uh, there are other things like, for example, the proposal proposer shall provide an AB 341, AB 827, AB 1826, and SB 1383 plan detailing the tasks, procedures, and schedules to ensure compliance with all those laws. And if you don't do that, you're not going to get it. Um, the things that they were looking for, refuse collection and disposal, organics, waste recycling, food rescue, organics procurement. In other words, buying recycled uh, organics and giving it to the public uh, and to the city, curbside recycling or MRF processing. The contract value was almost 10 million with a, with a seven year term. So we're talking about a, a total $70 million contract. And I think for City of LA, they said three and a half billion dollar per year. That was the total value. And over 10 years, that's 30 billion dollars. And since they would give you an extra 10 years before they go out to bid again, if you met their approval, then you're talking about, my gosh, uh, $60 billion in refuse collection just in the city of LA over 20 years. So the city of LA is, is huge, you know, compared to uh, the rest of the, the rest of the country. Um, this is a copy of the cover that I developed, uh, sort of a cover page, which included the, uh, who was going to uh, date, it was 827. 
Oh, this one here was 827, even though they, yeah, that was the right date. I'm sorry, 827 was the right date. And then it was presented to the city of Alhambra uh, to the city clerk. And then uh, they wanted to know who the key contact is, what their telephone number, facsimile number, address, and you had to put that all on the front cover. Ergo, I put it on the front cover and put a nice little picture with their truck and a 50 year seal because that company is 50 years old. So what goes into the um, actual uh, proposal? And so based on this outline that's provided, um, I put them into their own sections with similar numbering and such, uh, with tabs to provide the pagination between each section. So a tab can, so that people can easily reference where in a document they are. Um, and there's like, general requirements that were required, um, proposal forms, supporting costs, exceptions, and then into a proposer overview with what type of business structure, description of the proposer's experience, information regarding past and pending lit litigation, who the key personal, personnel are, financial information, insurance, and evidence of insurance. I actually provided that in there. Uh, a facility description, what what facilities would they have and be using? Transfer, processing, operating like a corporate yard uh, where they keep the trucks and then disposal. Um, they wanted an implementation plan, you know, how are they gonna transition? And then implementation for the different laws that they specified. What kind of customer service? Uh, give us a description of your automated carts. What kind of collection vehicles are you planning to use? minimum recycling requirements, recyclable materials program, what kind of organic waste recycling program, what kind of food recovery program, what kind of procurement of recovered organic waste products, how about employing the prior contractor employees, what do you plan to do about that, and what kind of proposal enhancements can you offer us. And so it was hundreds of pages that needed to be basically developed, you know, to put into this uh, proposal to the city. I don't know yet what um, the the um, outcome is with um, the city of Alhambra, but I can go back in the past to other winning proposals that I did. Um, this is a sample outcome, a winning proposal uh, for where disposal uh, with the County of LA Board of Supervisors, an exclusive franchise contract for the area of South Whittier. So they were very happy to get this notification uh, by email from the county and uh, and it kicked out another hauler, um, Bertek, I think it was. And uh, and so it took me about 35 hours of time, almost a week. And my time for the week was about $5,000. Um, and it was for 15,000 homes at about $3.6 million annually, $36 million over a 10 year period. So that's that's good money for, for this company. And even though it's not a heck of a lot of money for me, um, I think it's, it's a fair price because they, I don't have to compete with anybody else. They just call me up and say, can you do another proposal? This is great. And I just kind of use the same template and update it and spruce it up and put it in and give them another price. It's great. I love it. The other end of the spectrum are municipalities conducting an RFP process. Okay, so just like, you know, like a hauler uh, or any entity that's applying for, for like contract work, you have to fulfill whatever is required in the RFP. Well, somebody's got to develop the RFP. And um, that's probably something that maybe you've developed in, in another class or, or such. Uh, but our, developing an RFP can likewise be as difficult as developing the proposal. It takes time to write an RFP, an RFQ, or an RFB. Um, you got to make sure that that you got everything really scheduled, and and you got all your T's crossed and your I's dotted, and and you make sure that all the information is uh, correct, 
and germane and there's no technical issues that it's going to work out schedule wise with the existing contractor. You know, it's just, just a lot of work that goes into it. But let's say that you go through all that work and come up with a wonderful RFP and you ready to publish it. And it's like maybe, I don't know, a year in advance. OK, so you you put out that announcement and say uh, paperwork is available. Documents are available. Um, we're going to accept bids uh, a, a year from now. And um, and and at that point, uh, that starts a process. And in fact, uh, uh, in many RFPs, you don't allow the haulers to talk to anybody at the city except for the designated person. So once the RFP is out in the street, all communications must go through that individual. No more talking to the to city council or trying to win your way or or give them some special inducement to get them to vote your way, uh -uh, not allowed. So a lot of RFPs are, are done with a, um, a affidavit that must be filled out that says, from such and such date to time of submission, I did not, would not, did not ever, you know, uh, talk with anybody about this contract with the city. You know, so that's often uh, a requirement, you know, to do that. So you put that into the document as well. Um, but in any event, you get these packages that come in. Some of them may be quite huge. And and so you first got to go through, did, is everything there that everybody, you know, you ask for, for, from, for, from everybody, ask for from everybody. So you do a completeness review and and you might even do some background checks on the companies. And based on the completeness review, check, 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 check. Oh, here's something missing. Check, check, check. You have a choice. Do you tell the, the company that they missed on something? Do you, you know, like tell them that, uh, oops, we're sorry, but you missed on that. So, you know, better luck next time, 10 years from now. You know, I, I tend to err on, you have 36 hours, 72 hours to respond to this. Um, this is missing. If you still want to, you know, keep your submission in in queue, you must supply this missing information or answer these specific questions. Okay, so that's often a, a pretty good way to deal with it. So that's why I say request for additional information. That may be part of it. Um, but if you do that for one, you have to do that for all. You know, not just for for one. So if there's anything. You can ask anybody any any last things you you want to change, you know, because we're giving because we gave one, we're giving that to everybody. If there's anything you want to change, now's the time to do it. And you got 72 hours to do it. Okay, but a lot of times folks will not get a if nothing's wrong with anything else, you know, just one. That that's a that's a really tough thing. So often people will put in the RFP the stipulation that if you don't, if your submission is incomplete, it may result in disqualification. Okay, so just to protect the city. Okay, once you do that, you go through a technical review and and begin to piece it apart and have different people review it and look at it and, and you rank stuff, you rate them, you write questions, you know, you, you know, do you like this? What's your, what's your feeling? It's like a, it's like a popularity contest type of thing. You know, you're probably given a rating scale from one to 10 and you rate them and, and then reviewers all do different. You know, one person's easy, another person's difficult. One person's less technical and someone is more technical, you know, so everybody's got their different opinions on stuff. And that's why you sometimes you do that so that you do get a good, you know, range of opinions on things. And then you tabulate all of that. And maybe if you haven't opened up the the pricing, you do that. But often a lot of folks will give a technical ranking. And, and then from the technical ranking, they may, um, and if you didn't specify this in the uh, RFP, 
you know, this may be something you might have wanted to do, uh, but if you didn't do it, you can't do it. But if you did do it and you put this specification in, you can say that we will review technical proposals. And when we find three good technical proposals, we'll, we'll then open up bids and, and take a look at the bids. And, and so people can do that as well you know, in, in terms of, of review of, of packages and stuff. And sometimes you can do, consultants can do it, in-house can do it, or a combination of both. Eventually, you want to select a short list of, of people. <clears throat> and, and these applicants, you'll invite in, and they'll come in and generally give a short presentation. And then you go through and you have a, a, a number of people that will each ask questions of the interviewee. And the interviewee could have like the manager, the CFO, the consultant, uh, uh, recycling coordinator, you know, people like that. So just like the city side can have city manager, um, the finance director, the recycling coordinator, well, there'll be analogs for that with, with the holler. And everybody will have time to, to talk and ask, answer questions. And the city of LA spent $3 million on the RFP process with their consultants. And it took like about two and a half years to go through that. You know, it was just, just an amazing process. Um, typically, uh, a consultant will get $200,000 that's paid for by the winning bidder. So the city actually won't even pay for it. The community will pay for it. OK, because the winner will have to take money from what they were going to get. And and they know ahead of time how much it is, because they usually put that in there, that you will be required to pay X amount of dollars for this RF if you're the winning bidder. You know, so you know how much it is and you put that into your price, you know, so that at the end of the day, you're, you're going to get your money back. Well, now that we've gone through the uh, the world of uh, RFPs and RFBs and and Qs and so forth, let's take a little bit of time to talk about grant writing. Well, just like anything else, it has to do with money. It's it's like where's the money? Now, just for a, a definitional purposes. Grants are non-repayable funds or products dispersed or given by one party, grant makers, which are often a government department, a corporation, a foundation, or trust to a recipient, often but not always a nonprofit entity, educational institution, or they can be a business or an individual. In order to receive a grant, some form of grant writing often referred to as either a proposal or an application is required. So what I'm going to be talking about is like, how do you write this application and, um, and talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the grant applications I've, I've had an, um, the good fortune to be involved in. Now, according to the Foundation Center Trusts and foundations, uh, according to the Foundation Center, trusts and foundations number in excess of 88,000 and disperse in excess of $40 billion every year. In 2015, there were approximately uh, 1,521,052 charitable organizations. Um, the competition is fierce for the money. Now, funds come from government contracts and fees, about 73%. Contributions, gifts, and government grants, 21%. Uh, dues, special event income, rental income, net sales from goods, about oh, 6%. So that's uh, probably close to 100% right there. <clears throat> uh, and I got a map of the United States, but you know, you can really find um, nonprofit organizations, uh, grant grantors, 
uh, in every walk of life, no matter what you're doing. And, and a lot of folks are interested in literacy. They're interested in eco ecology, eco justice, uh, looking at uh, climate change. There's a whole host of things that folks are interested to try to put their money towards because folks make a lot of money, especially in the business sector, and they want to take that money and put it to good use. Kind of give back, you know, to the community. If I were to give you uh, all my best tips to good grants, it uh, would be these 10 items. Follow the instructions. Follow the instructions in the funding opportunity announcement carefully. Always follow. Start preparing. Once you know about something, start preparing your application early. Don't wait to the last minute. Be sure the application and responses to the report program requirements, in other words, your application responses, are complete and clearly written. Be brief, concise, and clear. People don't want to read a whole lot of stuff. Remember, they're probably getting tons and tons of these things. So you want to be brief, concise, and clear. And you want to tell them a good narrative. You, you want to make them feel for what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, be organized and logical. Show evidence of fiscal stability and sound fiscal management. You want to attend to any technical details. Don't leave a lot of things hanging or, um, you know, just be real vague. No, you, you, you really do have to put in as many technical details as you can without being overly wordy. I know it's, it's kind of a, a difficult tightrope, you know, a high, sort of like a high uh, uh, type tightrope uh, type situation, you know, you, you could fall at any, any point, um, you know, but you try to keep your balance and try to keep, you know, uh, uh, the, the amount of technical information you're putting into the uh, optimize it. And, and be really clear and concise and tell a good narrative. Uh, be careful in the use of attachments. Sometimes attachments don't always get attached. And if you're missing something, well, then sometimes you miss out completely because you don't always get a chance to submit something again. Um, print out and carefully proofread and review your electronic application to ensure accuracy and completion. Oftentimes, if they give you an opportunity to print it out, do so and really read it, reread it and read it and reread it. <laughs> give yourself like between the time you write and the time you read it, give yourself a few days because a lot of times if you go right into rereading it after you've written something, you're still thinking with your mind. You're not really looking with stuff. And then once you do, or are ready to submit, you know, once you do something, uh, submit it all at the same time. Don't don't try to piecemeal it. You're a lot of times you're going to get confused. There may be dozens of, of different documents you have to do. Did I put the last edition in? Did I put this in? And and a lot of times, you know, you may not be able to, um, you know, sus, you know, accurately identify everything that you put in. So these are my 10 tips to really good grants. Often, um, before you even get to an application, uh, there's something called a proposal inquiry letter. Inquiry letters are designed to convince the grant ma maker to consider your request. So this is where you want to tell a really good story, you know, give you the opportunity to give the grant maker a snapshot of your proposed program uh, or project and be sure to establish a connection between your proposal's goals and the grant maker's priorities and focus on details, clarity, and conciseness while conveying the impact your proposal will make on the need or problem you're addressing. The idea here is that you really want to tell a great, great story because this is sort of a interim step 
to actually submitting a, a formal uh, proposal or a um, application. So your inquiry letter, often many websites and foundations and, and others who are grant makers, they will ask you to tell us a little bit about it, give us a, you know, sort of a snapshot of what it is, you know, convince us that you should go to the next level. Okay, so this is your vision, your your elevator pitch, you might say, of writing, uh, but it's your opportunity to try to close. You know, always be closing, ABC. Try to close at every step of the way. Once you do get into the application, your application should follow uh, several main elements. Usually they ask for an organizational overview and purpose. They want you to state the reason for and the amount of the funding request. They want you to describe the needs or problem, including the target population, and give a lot of statistics and examples. And I, and I tell you, one thing else you can do is that you could do research and show that this is absolutely essential. Like nine out of 10 doctors recommend that, that um, this type of activity that you're proposing on should be accomplished, but it's never been done. And if you can find reputable sources that explain this, you know, my gosh, show this in your, in your application. Describe your project or program and list other project funders. You know, a lot of times prospected have been committed um, as matching funds are a necessity during, especially during this time. You know, if you can show uh, matching funds, like if you're asking for 100,000 and you got 100,000 already in matching funds, then, um, and other people say, if you can find the money, I'll give you this money. You know, then you want to start pulling these things together, you know, because like everybody wants to get on a winning team. You know, and if somebody else is willing to give you money, then that's great. Then you can use that to get to other people to give you more money. <clears throat> Here's an example of, of Cal Recycle. They have a grants portal and they take California climate investments, that's cap and trade dollars, and put them to work by offering a variety of different grant programs and loan programs as well. Uh, the Reuse Grant Program, uh, the Department of Res Resources Recycling and Recovery, that's Cal Recycle, offers the Reuse Grant Program as a pilot program in fiscal year 2019 and 20. Uh, Cal Recycle offers grant programs to provide financial assistance to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases pursuant to Public Resource Code 42999. That's uh, probably SB 1383 and a couple of others. The purpose of this competitive grant program is to lower overall greenhouse gas emissions by expanding and improving waste diversion in California through reuse. And um, we know that reuse gives jobs. It also gives dividends in greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, I did one very recently uh, for the reuse of wood. And they will specify, uh, you know, what products that they're looking for, what materials, uh, what kind of projects they would like to see, whether it's food rescue, wood reuse, you know, product reuse. Um, they'll, they'll specify that. So you can go on to the um, grant portal, the grants homepage. I got that identified here and it'll be in the uh, PDF uh, that you can go and look for potential grants that you could apply for online. Good luck. <clears throat> okay, going any place, you always got to take a first step. I tell you, first step could be um, uh, joining an organization and volunteering to help write grants. <clears throat> A lot of times, um, like I say, there's one and a half million, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations. They, they're they always looking for money. And uh, that's probably, in some cases, 90% of the work that they do is to go out and look for more money. 
And that means if, if you can find money, if you can do, if you are a good writer, you know, you have the potential to become a good grant writer. And you'd be surprised what you can do. Uh, but a lot of folks are looking for people that can help them write grants. So, hey, if you don't have an organization yet, you don't have a nonprofit, look for an organization that might be looking for someone like you, okay? Let me give you a real life example. I wrote grants for free in 1995, so long as my organization, my business was included in the work when and if the grant was awarded. And everybody was willing to give me, yeah, you do our grant. You know, you're gonna do it for free? Sure. The first year I applied for a million dollars and I won, I was awarded a million dollars. Not me personally, but my grant applica applicants, okay? They were ecstatic. And of course they turned around and said, all right, we have an agreement. You can do the work. You can be the grant manager. You know, you understand this stuff. You know what needs to be done. You know, just take care of stuff. You know, keep us informed. And uh, the value to me, $300,000 by which I started my business. The first year I made 300 grand. And I did it using OPM, other people's money, okay? And the $300,000 hired a lot of people to do the work that we wrote the grants for. So this is things that you can do too. Anybody can do it. I, I did it, you can do it. But first you gotta find an organization, whether it's a city or a business, or if it's a nonprofit that you can work with. And, and this is where your networking really can come in. Okay, just a little plug here to make sure that you don't forget to take the quizzes. There's 10 quizzes in this class. Each quiz conforms to a different presentation of my 10 presentations. Not any special lectures or, or guests that have uh, provided remarks, uh, just specifically the presentations I did, okay? All the answers to the quizzes are in the presentation. They're not in the book. You use the book to learn about a greater, you might say, the greater field out there and um, um, be able to see what other people have done in other communities so you get a, a greater sense of, of what's what's happened over time. Um, and you're gonna do a book review, of course, and, and that's worth five points. So again, these quizzes are represent over 60%, represent exactly 60% of your grade. 